Good Wednesday morning and welcome into a solo edition of the KSO Show. I'm Mason, both part of K-State Online, members of the On3 Network. Just me with you today as uh, Drew and D.Y. getting better prepared for the hustle and bustle of Big 12 Media Basketball Day. We will all be there today. Uh, That is, I guess, if you're listening to this on Wednesday. So we will have plenty of coverage written and on the YouTube as well. And we'll see kind of what else we can do to bring a different, unique look at the Cats. Obviously, D.Y. and the Three Maw guys will have you covered with plenty of great uh, interviews from that. We'll try to get some of our own. We'll also try to be a little bit different, try to find uh, what we can do to uh, get intermixed with uh, everybody that will be there for the Wildcats this year. Should be a fun time. 14 teams at Big 12 Media Day. I'm looking forward to just seeing what that's like. I, I, I missed out on Football Media Day this year. It's too close to the due date for my wife, and uh, nobody knew it at the time, but I was about to transition into a new job, so uh, there wasn't much reason for me to be down there for uh, for uh, a place I wasn't going to be for much longer. So, uh, fortunately, uh, I get to experience this. I love Big 12 basketball. You know, I, I know everybody is uh, all about football and everything, but... Uh, I, I love college basketball easily more than college football. Basketball season is awesome. We're getting to that time of the year where I am desperate and ready for basketball season to come, so I'm excited for it. But today, it's all about football as we recap what Chris Kleiman had to say in his Tuesday press conference as we do every Wednesday here on KSO. And look, Chris Kleiman had to obviously immediately address the Avery Johnson, Will Howard stuff. We know how it ended up working out. There is the or on the depth chart with how everything is playing out. And Chris Kleiman, you know, basically handled it how I thought he would. No starter has been named, nothing of that magnitude. So still a lot to kind of go off of and and let things be decided. But uh, it's going to be interesting to kind of see how things end up going moving forward. Other things that came up, an injury update on Will Lee, uh, and just some other various things that involved either the matchup with TCU or things that came out of the Texas Tech game. So Let's just dive straight into this quarterback thing. It's what everybody is the most interested in. It's dominated the conversation the last four days now. It is the thing that, uh, look, I I am relentlessly tracking to seeing how things do and and what feedback we're getting, uh, at least on the the YouTube and, and podcast side of things. If it has Avery Johnson's name on it, it is straight gold. So looking forward to uh, seeing what the, the rest of the season brings. But from an on-field perspective, something that does not impact me or you or anybody at all. It's just how it impacts the K-State football team. Avery Johnson was spectacular on Saturday, and it's not just the the, the regular fan or whoever that saw it. Obviously, Chris Kleiman saw it and understands it, and he kind of addressed how a two-quarterback system can work coming off of being asked who would start, how the breakdown is going to play. This is what Chris Kleiman had to say and why he believes that Avery Johnson and Will Howard could make it work if that's indeed the route they go. That's a, that's a valid point. Good question. Uh, I don't know how it's going to work out on Saturday, guys. It's Tuesday right now. And what we learned from this past Saturday is that um, we've seen Will play at a really high level and be successful. And then we saw Avery play at a high level and be successful. And so we feel comfortable um, with both guys uh, leading this football team. I couldn't tell you. I don't have the answer. CK wouldn't have the answer if you thought it would be a 60-40, 50-50, 90-10 split. We have no idea. We're going to go through the game plan and see um, who, where, and what gives us the best opportunity. I think there are elements there where Chris Kleiman is telling the truth. I think that they don't know what the split is going to look like yet. I do think that deep down he believes and he is planning on using both guys, though, on Saturday. I don't think this is a scenario where one of them goes out there and we don't see the other one at all. And it's just going to probably come down to the flow of the game. And ultimately, like you said in there, how do you view what TCU is less equipped to handle? How how is this going to go down? I mean, there is a scenario where K-State could run into a team where you think, okay, we might be able to use Avery John or Will Howard's arm a little bit more, but that's maybe something we would have said about Will Howard five weeks ago. I don't know that we're saying that now about him. The The decision-making isn't there. It's clear that the the receivers are part of the problem in, in some way. 
each person can determine to what scale the receivers share blame and that they have issues in what case it has going on with. But it is clear that there is somewhat of an issue with the, the receiving unit. And obviously that doesn't help a guy like Will Howard that the majority of what he needs to do is in the passing game. Obviously he has been a successful runner. I wouldn't say that he is a, a good runner. He gets schemed up in the run game a lot. He can execute when the play is designed in there. But the stuff that takes creativity, the stuff that Avery Johnson is good at, he doesn't have that. Avery Johnson is a good runner. He's a great runner, as we've seen so far. And there's the opportunity for him to be a better passer. And that was one of the other things that Chris Kleiman said was, you know, they, they believe in his passing ability. And he thinks and knows that Avery Johnson is a better passer than what people are probably assuming and giving him credit for right now because they haven't gotten to see it in a major way. So I will have to see. I, I don't know that a true two quarterback system where they're trading off every couple of series. I don't know that that can actually work. I mean, ha have we actually ever seen a scenario in which that worked? I, I think it gets talked about a lot. It gets used a lot. And when that happens, typically one guy ends up taking the job. I mean, this is an extreme example and K-State should not be this bad at any point this season. But if you think about it, Oklahoma State was trying this, basically. The first three games of the season, Mike Gundy was playing all three quarterbacks that he had and rotating them out. Nobody could get it in a flow. It, it impacted the rest of the way that the guys on the team played. You know, there are just some dudes that you need to know, and it's going to benefit you, and some guys are going to be better. It also changes the way that the offensive coordinator has to call the game, and that's something that right now, like, Obviously, Colin Klein is going to have to call the game differently when Avery Johnson is in the game versus Will Howard. And the way Will Howard has played has also had to change the way that Colin Klein has, has called the game. So there's all of this to take into consideration when you know trying to determine about a two-quarterback system. We will see uh, if, if K-State ends up you know perfecting it, being the first ones really ever to make this thing happen in some major way. And obviously it's been talked about a lot at K-State in the past. There have been different instances where you've had two quarterbacks. Obviously, um, Jake Waters, Daniel Sams is one of those. Uh, now that one, I don't know. I was team Daniel Sams in the moment. Maybe I'm less team Daniel Sams now. I still love Daniel Sams, not to the level of uh, RIP my former coworker John Kurtz did, uh, not dead. John Kurtz, that is. I don't think Daniel Sam's dead either. I'm like, I, that, that's bad of me to say. But I, I think then we also saw the Skylar Thompson and Alex Delton situation. That was much more delicate. There were obviously hurt feelings to go all around there. And I don't think it was just the quarterbacks involved. I think it was the coaches involved in that decision, where if you were on one side, you wanted your guy. And if you weren't, then you, know, you, you were kind of upset about how it played out. And it's just tough to get in a rhythm. It's tough to really establish an offense. And the herky-jerky that goes on there with, with your guys, it just isn't fair to anybody. So that's why I think that K-State probably needs to go out there and just make one guy the guy. And I'm on the record saying that I think that guy should be Avery Johnson right now. He has earned that opportunity. He has earned that right. You should give it to him if you're Chris Kleiman in K-State. He is the guy that went out there. He had a couple of opportunities, and the guy ahead of him, slipped up a little bit, and when the guy had those few opportunities, he took them, ran with it, and that's why he got the majority of the snaps in the second half. And based on how that played out in Lubbock, you, you got to give Avery Johnson the go. I, I think even if you look at this game and in your head and on paper you tried saying, you know, the type of quarterback Will Howard is is probably the better way to go here. I still think you have to say that we're going to go out there and we're going to try and execute the game plan with Avery Johnson in, in a couple of ways. You trust Avery Johnson's arm because they are talking it up and they believe in it. And then also you say, Avery Johnson's so good and he's better than a lot of the guys out there, at least in just pure talent, raw talent, that we can do what he does well because he's going to execute it no matter what happens. It doesn't have to be the other team is bad at this or bad at that. I, I think that's something to take into consideration uh, as this thing moves forward. I mean, defensively, TCU... Uh, is is in the top half of the league against the pass. Uh, TCU also right there, middle of the pack, top half of uh, against the run. So it's not like TCU is outweighing it one way or the other. They've also played some teams that aren't necessarily the most inspiring offensively. I mean, you think about the the, the games that TCU has played so far uh, when it comes to the offensive side of the ball in the Big Twelve. It, they're not world beaters. I mean, they've played BYU, West Virginia. And Iowa State, obviously, now Iowa State's playing a little bit better. Um, so, uh, and Houston. So, I don't think that you can necessarily look at it and say, oh, man, 
Uh, we know that that defense is stout and can sh shut all this down. You, you really can't. They haven't played any of the offenses that scare you. K-State with Avery Johnson has an offense that probably scares you right now. And the way that the, the offense was playing with Will Howard at quarterback, it wasn't the most frightening thing. You had to be mindful of it, but it wasn't the most frightening thing in the moment. As for how Will Howard handled how things played out on Saturday, Chris Kleiman had something to say on that. He also said, hey, don't forget, DJ Ginn's kind of went through the same thing on Saturday where they, you know, in the second half, things dried up. He was not getting the ball because Treshawn Ward was having a great game. DJ Giddens just wasn't as effective, and they rode the hot hand there as well. Here is uh, Chris Kleiman's word on them. But I'm sure it's not not easy. I know it's not easy. Uh, but, um, you know, that's – I'm sure deep down Will was frustrated, but he also wants to win, and that's what we need here, and that's what we expect here. And – you know, one of our core values is to be selfless. And on Saturday, he had to be selfless. Um, and he helped Avery. He and Avery are very close. A Adrian and, and uh, Will were very close. And I think when Will started playing, even though Adrian was hurt, it really helped him to have that support. And I know that Will saw that and felt that from Adrian, that he wanted to give the same thing to Avery, whether it's by uh, – uh, a coach's decision, an injury, or what gives us a better opportunity to be successful, he still wants K-State to win. And I also don't want to overshadow the fact that uh, D.J. Giddens was in that same boat. And it's easy to talk about the quarterbacks. That's the most high-profile position. But Treshawn Ward, we just kept giving it to, and we kept D.J. on the sideline for a lot of the same reasons. Treshawn was kind of the hot hand as well as some of the plays that we were running fit him pretty well. And so, you know, one of the things we talked about before the game is own your role. If that's one play, 10 plays, 50 plays, 80 plays, and do the best you can and own that role. And if, you're, if your role is no plays and you're a backup and a special teams guy, be the best cheerleader you can and help us get this W. So obviously Chris Kleiman's saying the right things there. And, and I do think that, at least Saturday, we saw Will Howard and DJ Giddens. They, they handled it just fine. And both guys are going to be ready if they have to go out there and play. Um, I think the DJ Giddens situation is clearly obviously and obviously not the same as the Will Howard thing. DJ Giddens is going to get a ton of carries, and there are going to be a lot of games where they're force-feeding him. They're trying to get him going because he and Treshawn Ward are both effective and needed. And you you can it's easier to play multiple running backs. It's not like quarterback where – there is a flow. These guys, you know, need to handle this, how it, how it gets handled, where they get full drives. They get multiple drives in a row. It's not this just back and forth, back and forth. For Will Howard, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I think Chris Kleiman just, uh, you know, admitting and being straight up that, hey, like it's, it's clearly going to suck for these guys when this happens it is the right thing to do. Don't dance around it and just, you know, be, oh, hey, this guy, it's, he's fine with it. Like Chris Kleiman is is right in saying, yeah, he he'll, he's all about the team winning. He's good. He, he understands how some of this works out. He had that same relationship with Adrian Martinez last year. Uh, now the roles are reversed. But at the end of the day, he also is open to understanding it's not a very fun situation and feeling to be in. And I, I at least appreciate how this thing is playing out so far. I don't think that it's something that K-State has to worry about uh, with how it will play out in, in terms of, you know, will, will Howard rebel or something like that. I don't know. You don't have to worry about that. It's just one of those deals where he'll probably sit there, and if he's not out on the field, he'll be upset about it, which is okay. It's okay to be that way. It's okay if you're if you're a fan and you you think that Will Howard should still be the starting quarterback. It's okay to feel that way and be upset about it, um, but you still have to go out and, and support you know the guy that is out there doing it. And he did it at a high level on Saturday in terms of Avery Johnson. So we'll see how it goes, and uh, that will be that at least on the the quarterback situation uh, when it comes to it this evening. Now. As we look forward to some of the other things that are going on and what was mentioned by Chris Kleiman, he gave an injury update on Will Lee. The corner for the Wildcats had to miss the game on Saturday after injuring himself in the in the first half against Oklahoma State. That's a situation that Chris Kleiman didn't have the clearest update on, but at least was somewhat optimistic and gave the uh, open window that he could play against the Horned Frogs. Um, we hope he can practice on Wednesday. He was around... Yesterday did not practice, will not practice today. He'll be around uh, again today. 
And if everything goes all right today, then he would practice on Wednesday and be available. I don't know how much, you know, we'd have to practice him Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to see where he could provide some depth or help to us. I think it would be big to have him out there. I mean, this is a defense that finally just made some plays for the first time all season. Given the three interceptions all came from the safeties, not the corners, but Willie does have a pick on the year, and he probably profiles as the guy that you would expect maybe the most in terms of making those turnovers right now just because of how hyped he was coming out of the JUCO ranks last season. And so it would be big to have him out there. It gives you a big boost, especially against this TCU offense that they, they will throw the ball. They will certainly be active in that regard. Um, TCU has not been shy in doing that this season. They are averaging probably right around 350 yards passing a game. Um, maybe my math is, is terrible on that, but I think that's probably close to accurate. I guess it's probably a little less than that. But Josh Hoover just came in and lit it up <laughs> this past week against BYU. He threw it 58 times for 439 yards and four touchdowns. They're going to throw it all over the place. J.P. Richardson, the Oklahoma State transfer, had a big day at receiver. So having as many guys possible that you trust being ready at corner is going to be beneficial in this game. And also being able to maybe have a guy that can can help shut down a little bit and possibly make a big play uh, because Chris Kleiman has talked about it all season that these turnovers could come in bunches. Will Lee is a guy that could help you get him. You need him out there. And uh, he's probably a guy that could maybe help a little bit because one of the criticisms about the corners that I had this week, and we've known this all season, it's no secret, but the ball skills aren't very good. When the ball is in the air and there's a chance to make a play or you need to make a play, they've struggled. They've done some other things really well in coverage. They they do a good job at times of preventing guys from getting the ball and um, making some tackles. But this past weekend, it was a bad tackling weekend, and it was cer- certainly a bad ball skills weekend for these guys. So that's the update on Will Lee. Uh, K-State's a better team with Will Lee available. And uh, if they have him on Saturday, that is a serious boost and a good good thing for this defense to have. As for some of the other guys that might get involved in the game on Saturday, Jace Brown was a name that came up. There was some steam about, hey, he's going to get some more opportunities uh, heading into the Texas Tech game. He did. They used him on, on punk coverage, and Chris Kleiman raved about him in that. They also had him out there more on offense. He had a, a good key block early in the game, and then his lone catch of the night was a pretty solid 21-yard pickup from Avery Johnson, which was good on both accounts to see Avery Johnson make that type of throw and Jace Brown go make that kind of catch. The blocking for Brown was good all night long. It's probably earned Jace Jace Brown a few more snaps than what he even got against Texas Tech and just opportunities galore. This is what Chris Kleiman had to say on his true freshman receiver. Yeah, um, I think we talked before. He he had missed a little bit of time, uh, but he's been back with us the last 10 days and he, he's got a speed factor that is really, really good that um, we've got to find ways to get him uh, involved, incorporated offensively, and then as well as special teams. And in last uh, last week at Tech, it was one of those things where, hey, you're going to go on punt now, and you're going to do what Echo Boydo did last year. You're going to outrun everybody and force a fair catch. Uh, and it's what he did against an excellent return team. Now, um, the game continues to slow down. Can we find some ways to uh, to get him the football on offense? I know that that's one of the things that our offense is looking at, as well as continuing to try to find ways that we can push the ball downfield with with Phil, J. Jack, Keegan, R. J. But uh, uh, Jace is in that mix with him. I'm all about that from Chris Kleiman. More opportunities for Jace Brown. He's a guy that went out there, proved that he deserves more of them. Give it to him because there's not really anybody on this receiving core that is earning snaps right now based off of how they've played. So if you have a guy that's gone out and earned it, give him every opportunity uh, before you say, okay, we got to take it back. You're just not ready for this. Jace Brown right now is ready for it, at least to get the opportunity. So that makes for an exciting time. It's what a lot of people have called for. Get some of these younger receivers involved. Um, Trey Spivey is a guy that I think is going to be a very, very good receiver at K-State in the future. Just right now, he's not necessarily ready. Jace Brown, one of the guys that is more ready, he's going to get that opportunity. I think it's important for K-State to get him out there. And right now, I mean, you might make the case that, uh, especially since Keegan Johnson's starting to get healthy, so maybe there's some more belief. He's made a couple of nice plays when he's gotten some touches. So I think one of the things that you can take a look at is say, okay, 
the best three and best trio that you could put out there for K-State right now at receiver is probably Phillip Brooks, Keegan Johnson, and Jace Brown. Now, I know people are going to say, well, Phillip Brooks, that blocking has been suspect. We've heard that for a couple of weeks now. That's true. There are some plays that Phillip Brooks has done not very well. But at the end of the day, he's still probably the most reliable target. And actually, I give him props for going up and getting that ball in the first drive of the game that set K-State up for a field goal. Um, that was probably one of the more impressive catches of Philip Brooks' career based off of what we've seen. So I, I give some some confidence in, in how the receivers are maybe starting to make baby steps. They're still not great. They're still largely a, a big part of why the passing game has not been successful, but uh, there, there was at least the positive of Chase Brown. Now, Chris Kleiman had, obviously, after a win, the ability to be very positive about a lot of things. A totally different tune from last week's press conference where after the loss to Oklahoma State and getting asked certain questions, he was basically straight up and said, yeah, there's not a whole lot to say that, that's been good this year. When he was asked about positives and he's, his, the first words out of his mouth were Jack Bloomer, who, by the way, shout out, played a really good game on Saturday against Texas Tech. I thought Jack Bloomer was very good, but having your punter be the biggest positive of your season through uh, five games, that is no bueno. So fortunately, he was a little bit more positive because he had some reasons and some rights to be. Although, there was one negative that he pointed out, and I think that a lot of people probably are thinking the exact same thing. Here's what Chris Kleiman had to say about how the return game needs to get better. We still have to keep getting better at our return game. We had one set up for Phil. We got called for for a holding um, that, you know, We'll get that corrected, but we had something there for the first time in a while. Um, kick return, it's as you guys know, it, it's we had one, didn't we were just okay on. It's just the ball is getting kicked out of the end zone, just like we are as well with Chris. It's just there's not many opportunities right now. So we'll see the the kicking unit that that makes sense. Teams are just booting it through the back right now, and also they're they're less concerned about the ball going out of bounds. Because now, since you get the ball at the 25, teams are realizing that you know that extra 10 yards doesn't mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things on a kickoff. But I do like the move that was made with giving Treshawn Ward opportunities to return kicks. The problem was that he ran the ball so well at running back that maybe you start to rethink that a little bit. But I think his skill set sets up there. Phillip Brooks, in my eyes, he's had some great moments in the punt return game. I still don't think of Philip Brooks as a great return man. He's fine in the punt return unit. That's where he's proven himself. There's really never been any reason to think that Philip Brooks can return kicks. Um, I don't know that he's necessarily fast enough for that either. So I don't like Philip Brooks on the kick return for K State. And I do like them giving opportunities to other players. And Trayshawn Ward profiles nicely there. But K State has to be better in in the return game. I mean, Maybe there's an, a season in there that, that I'm forgetting, but it seems like this is the latest K-State has gone into the season without a kick return for a touchdown in a long, long time. And there really seems to be no end in sight for this drought that K-State currently has because they've really not come very close all season long to taking a kick back for a touchdown. And maybe you're waiting for that shoe to drop, but it's not coming. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to see it. And that's one concern is that the return game has dropped off for K-State uh, over the, the past two seasons. And I think that uh, anything you can try back there, you have to, because it's obvious it has to get better. And the punt return, same thing. K-State's got to use that to their advantage. They really haven't this year. And we'll see uh, if they're able to start implementing that over the final, final half of the season. Moving on, TCU, the opponent of the week. Chris Kleiman was obviously asked a, a couple of questions about the Horned Frogs and this now history that K-State has with TCU. This has turned into a pretty good naturally born rivalry, I think, in the Big 12. Not necessarily to the extent, obviously, K-State and KU and K-State and Iowa State, but I think if you ask both sets of fans, they would feel some serious animosity towards the other. It certainly helps you played two tight games last year. And, you know, TCU won the first meeting. K-State got the revenge in the Big 12 championship game, the way it played out. And there's, you know, a lot of things to not like about the way that TCU and uh, the TCU fans have handled business. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we, the Kendall Bryles is on staff now. Very easy to not like a guy that was that directly associated with the crap that went on at Baylor. 
Uh, also, I mean, K-State was in Fort Worth last year when TCU fans were throwing beer bottles onto the K-State sideline in the field at Amon G. Carter Stadium. Uh, TCU fans have a, a bad track record of booing during significant injuries to opponents and just a lot of things where I think things have built up over time. And these TCU fans, boy, they are something else to deal with. So I think this is a good thing in the league. And K-State and TCU always seem to play good games. Here's what Chris Kleiman said on why the games are always so close with TCU. Uh, they're, they're really athletic, really physical, really fast. They're well coached. Um, you know, they they have, uh, really good players at all three levels on defense. And it's, it's interesting because the biggest similarity is how is the defenses that both teams play, uh, that, uh, they're in the three, three, five, we're in the three, three, five. There's some, there's a few different things that we do than they do, but you know, like for this week, and I'm sure they're the same way. The scout team looks are probably easier to run because, uh, some of the similarities, but uh, I, I just think we match up and they match up with us really well to make it really competitive games. And it's going to be another probably semi-tight game. I know that the line is pretty big in favor of K-State. just seems like maybe that's a little bit uh, too high for the game. We'll ultimately see how it plays out, but these teams play each other tight. They give good games. They give good battles, and I do think that there are a lot of similarities at times between the two sides. As for directly thinking about memories or similarities from last year's matchup that playing TCU will bring. Uh, this is what Chris Kleiman had to say about that. Um, depends on which side of the ball you look at, honestly, in the fact of when I'm watching with the offense, we have that as part of one of our cutups because it's the same defensive coordinator. When I'm watching um, with, with the defense, it's not because we don't have that. Um, but you do that, you, 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 the kids do, we do from a personnel standpoint. Um, but it just seems like, and I know it was only twice, but it seems like we've played, it, played them an awful lot. Um, and, uh, you know, what? yeah, brings back great memories when, when you have the game at AT&T. Brings back some awful memories when you have the game at Fort Worth. You know, that one didn't end as well. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's probably mixed. Yeah, I mean, a good way to look at it. Obviously, the Fort Worth game was a, a kick in the gut last year for uh, the Wildcats, but it kind of springboarded them forward. You got a good performance out of Will Howard that made you think, oh, okay, might be able to do some things here. And they got the revenge at AT&T Stadium. And, uh, you know, there are some things that they're going to be able to derive from last year's game. Probably for the guys that were on the team last year, you, you get a good sense of confidence in, in what you can do against this team or maybe what you can improve upon from last year. But – there are some changes to them, and obviously it's a different team with a lot of different talent. The offense is, is going to be different in a lot of ways. It's a new offensive coordinator, and Max Duggan is gone. Quentin Johnston is gone. Kendra Miller is gone. A lot of these guys that made plays last year for TCU are not on the roster anymore, and uh, K-State will have a totally different look out there from TCU. But, I mean, they, they've got a situation where Hoover played well over the weekend, and J John Paul Richardson, I think, is – a great receiver. I mean, that's a guy that I would have liked K-State to have been able to get in, out of the, the portal this past season coming from Oklahoma State, but he chose TCU, and it's worked out for him so far there. Uh, I think he's right around 400 yards receiving on the season and had a ma monstrous game against uh, BYU over the weekend. So, you know, just one of those things Chris Kleiman understands that there's been some of this uh, back and forth and the similarities are there, but they can't take too much. And I also think one thing to, to just – in things with, I think this team is probably going to be better prepared because obviously the last time out they beat TCU in a major way, in a major game and all that, but they've already learned this year that you can't take last year's performance and translate it to this year because it can add, it can end badly. And that's what happened in the game against Oklahoma state. And so I, I definitely think that they'll be mindful of that and we'll um, just have to see how it plays out over the weekend between the Cats and the Frogs. But that will be a 6 o'clock kick on Saturday night. D.Y. will be back with me on Friday for the pregame show as we will preview everything going on with K-State and TCU, give our best bets, do all of that as always. And then, of course, uh, in the in-between there, lots of great stuff coming out of Big 12 Men's Basketball Media Days on Wednesday, giving you some looks at the Cats, hearing the thoughts from Jerome Tang and the players in attendance and maybe some of the other things that we hear and see from uh, Kansas City. Going to be good to get back there and get closer to the start of basketball season, half a month away 
from getting things underway with K-State getting the, the season going. So that is how the, the rest of the week looks on KSO. If you are not part of K-State Online, make sure you're doing so. Go to On3, get signed up for all the great inside info and coverage of the Wildcats that you could possibly want. It is truly the best way to keep up with K-State sports if you are that into it, which if you're watching this and you're still listening at this point, you're probably that into it. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the KSO YouTube page. That way you uh, immediately can see when Avery Johnson highlights get posted or the post-game press conferences and anything else that you need from K-State game coverage and everything else. Uh, there is the possibility that on Thursday, K-State gets a significant commitment from Michael Boganowski from Junction City. We will see what ends up coming out of that. And if that happens, we will have immediate coverage for you right here on KSO, which is another good tease. Recruiting trail is starting to heat up for K-State in the 2024 class. It's been a small class to this point, but the Wildcats are doing their best to flip some significant players and also land some uh, late, late commitments from uncommitted guys. So, so stay tuned to all that, and the best place to get it is K-State Online. That will do it for myself. I'm Mason Voth, back again on Friday with Derek Young. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State.